Alrighty, so I have 1101, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, so for those of you in the future, hi, uh, thank you for taking a look. For those of you who are with us right now, uh, good morning and welcome to the Meeting Basic Needs Workshop. My name is Shauna Freeman, I'm a business faculty member and the chair of the assessment committee. I'm also joined by Mary Ellen Bob, you want to introduce yourselves? Hello, good morning. My name is Mariella Briga, and I'm the Director of Student Success. And I'm Bob Scribner. I, I'm the Program Manager for Learning and Teaching Center. And so again, we want to thank you guys for joining us. We're really excited to share this workshop with you. It is designed to offer resources that can better help us support students both inside and especially outside of the classroom. So just to give you a quick overview Donna, of, kind of, oh, uh, yes. Uh, there was a message on the chat that it's important. Oh, I'm sorry, let's see. Oh, okay, yes, one second. Thank you, Bobby, let's see if I can turn that on. I know it's an option in here. It just says live transcripts, download <clears throat> transcription, I think. Oh, is this it? Okay, yay, it's working. Thank you so much, Bobby. <laughs> I think that's maybe my first time uh, using it, so I'm, I'm excited, this is cool. All right, so uh, to give a quick overview of uh, what this workshop is about, it's really broken into uh, essentially three parts. So first, Mariella, she will share some realities that many of our students are facing and the resources that Highline offers through the Support Center. Um, the second portion will be me introducing <coughs> the Basic Needs Canvas page. And then the third portion will be led by Bob, who's gonna bring all of this back into the classroom and discuss ways in which our teaching can also support students who are experiencing basic needs and security. And uh, as the photo of Maslow's hierarchy of needs reminds us here, students' basic needs must be met before they can bring their best to the classroom. And as a part of the Guided Pathways uh, project that we have going on, uh, this is led by the assessment committee, primarily because we are focused on improving student learning by being committed to supporting the whole student um, for them to do their best. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Mariella uh, so she can share more on the support center and Highline resources. Thank you, thank you, Shauna. Hello and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very, very grateful to have all you here joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, we hope that you get a lot out of this and that you stay connected with us. Um, this slide here is just to show all of the different um, departments, programs, resources that are available in the support center over in building one. So I didn't want to um, take any time to really go over each one of these, but I did want to include them just to give you a more holistic sense of the different things that are available in that um, support center. Um, I know we haven't been to campus for a while, so just to kind of give you a refresher on who, who we are and what we do holistically. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk a little bit about or kind of get your juices flowing is around um, what students are dealing with when they're navigating poverty in our community. So I wanted you to take a minute or two to kind of reflect on this question. What does navigating poverty in our college's service district look like? And so I'm talking about service district. I'm talking about the area, the geographical area that we generally serve. Yes, students can come from other areas, but for the most part, we have those, you know, kind of boundaries um, in South King County. So take a second to think about what does navigating poverty in our college's service district look like? So I'm gonna let you reflect on that. And I'm going to invite you guys to either share by unmuting or by putting in the chat just some key words. It doesn't have to be a full paragraph or a full thought. It could be one word, a phrase. What, does, what are the realities of navigating poverty in our college's service district look like? So thank you for those who are already joining in the chat. We've got a few responses here. A lot of bus connections for sure, off Pack Highway. There's the buses and anything off of that, you gotta transfer. Um, very stressful. There is food insecurity, a lot of waiting. Waiting um, is, is uh, time, right? Time, money, all of the 
stressors, juggling, parenting, school, support. So I invite you guys to kind of scroll through these great reflections here. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot of these things here that I see popping up are things that are going to be um, touched on in this presentation. So I'm glad to see that many of you are already kind of in tune and in touch with what that means. So let's talk a little bit about some of the financial realities that are happening today. Um, these are some these are some facts here that happened in the last year. We know what the financial realities were up through 2019, but there have been some major changes, obviously, in 2020. Um, Columbia University found 8 million more Americans are now in poverty than the previous year. And of course, we've got major equity issues as it relates to things such as the wealth gap. Um, and also uh, the way that the wealth gap is impacted intersectionally. So these are really important things to keep in mind and to know that yes, these are happening here in South King County, but these are even larger issues um, that our families have been dealing with for generations. Um, and I also invite us to kind of um, flip sometimes our framework, um, or, or I guess maybe our perspective more so than our framework is that we talk about how one of the bullet points here, women earn less, women earn less, women of color earn even less. For myself, as a Latinx woman, I earn 55 cents per dollar um, uh, that a male, my male, white male counterpart earns. And I have definitely experienced that in my life. Um, but another way to look at it is that companies pay me less, right? Pay me a lot less. And it's not just always that I earn less, it's that you know we get paid less. So it's really important to um, be critical in the way that we, um, analyze and, and, and accept these facts as well. And so I just wanna say that, you know, at the Highline Support Center, we really try to support students, as Shauna mentioned earlier, as a whole person. Yes, you are our student, but you also are a whole person. Um, and so we wanna keep those things in mind. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about some of the data that's out there around basic needs for food. So the FDA has um, quite a bit of food screening security questions. These are some examples there that you can read. Um, when we launched the Highland Community Pantry, we made sure to add in in our exit survey some of these questions so that we could capture the same data for our students that these larger institutions are capturing for our residents nationwide. So the FDA is one of them. The Hope Center for College Community um, is another big, big leaders, particularly in this area, in the area of students, housing and food insecurity. So I wanted you guys to see kind of what the examples are of the questions of how we determine food insecurity. And the next um, graphic here shows that the FDA has um, found just in 2019, which I know there's been changes in 2020, not for the better, that 10% of households are food insecure. However, the Hope Center found in 2018 that 56% of student households are food insecure. Both of these surveys had about 34,000 respondents. So when you're looking at this, it's really important to realize that um, there's this huge jump between your general population households and food insecurity and your student households and food insecurity. And really take in mind the types of sacrifices that students are making to be with us every single day and really honor that. Here at Highline, we launched our um, community pantry. Um, we had the grand opening fall of 2018. So that's six quarters, just over one calendar year. In that time frame, we counted 15,647 6, 15, visitors. So there were some visitors we didn't count. We don't force people to do this survey. We didn't force, you know, people were, you know, getting comfortable just kind of going and go, but we, in that time frame counted that many just visitors just coming to the pantry and shopping and grabbing things. Um, our data was more in line, same with the Hope Center data, that it would go between 54 to 58% of those folks being food insecure. And a lot of those folks actually do have EBT. So although that's one of our services that we provide and we send people up for um, basic food benefits, that's not you know, solving the food insecurity problem. In fact, 686 unique students said that they would use their EBT card to purchase food on campus if that was an option. 
<clears throat> so another area that we um, really try to make an intentional effort on is around these financial emergencies. So we have the last couple of years had about $125,000 annually from the United Way and the Highland College Foundation. Um, the average award, this is across King County, is about $680. Um, and that we really try to focus on trusting the student. I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a little bit. We have a new program, it's, it's an app called Equity. We're in the pilot phase. We've spent 30,000 of our 60,000 for that pilot phase and that does not cut into our regular 125,000. But this is a, a new resource um, because it's based on the phone. Students can do it on their own. It's much, much quicker turnaround to get funds. But like I said, we're still ironing out some kinks, but this equity app does also come from the Hope Center folks. So it is already connected to that world of food and housing security. <clears throat> so um, another another way that the that the government and folks, um, federal government, uh, measure homelessness and housing insecurity is through these questions here. These are examples here. And we also put these on the exit survey in the pantry. And so I wanted you guys to get a sense of how many students are also experiencing these types of realities. So one of the one of the figures that really popped out to me was number three there. In the past um, two years, have you ever been homeless? 165 people said yes. And that was just in that one year period, you know, just before we left campus. Um, and then did you ever move in with other people even for a little while because of financial problems? Yes, 312 people. So the housing um, situation, as we already know in South King County, or even just in Western Washington is really, really tough. Um, but our students are no exception and uh, nationwide, this is also a trend. And then the last couple little facts I wanted to share about this portion here is, and this is according to Equity, each year, 5 million students nationwide drop or stop out of college due to a financial emergency of less than $500. And across all six quarters, we were collecting this survey, 135 students reported experiencing homelessness since starting college with us. And what I think is really powerful about that figure is that they're still students. We only know this because they're still here with us. So they started school, then experienced homelessness, and are still here with us to tell us about it. Um, and I think that's pretty remarkable. Um, I want to say that, oh, can you go back one more quick side second there, Shauna, about this trust the student part? This is very different than a lot of the ways that we are cultured to think about financial assistance in our, in our larger American context. I think a lot of the times we... Um, see the need for cash aid. The need for cash aid is viewed with suspicion, right? And uh, for potential abuse. And, you know, we've been doing this for several, several quarters, definitely over two calendar years. And I can count the people on one hand who have, you know, taken things to, to a place where we needed to kind of rein them in a little bit and kind of check in on what's really going on. And this is, you know, for the most part, we do not require students to go through any additional hoops. They say they need their, they have the emergency, they get it taken care of with us. Um, we're not asking them to take another meeting, to have a bill in their name, to come back and do this back and forth. It's really just a different way to support students for them to say, I'm ha I have an emergency, my tire is flat, this or that happened. And also I wanna point out, we're one of the schools that does not, that goes through our foundation, not through our financial aid office. When you go through the financial aid office, you could potentially be impacting other aid. You could potentially be impacting the way that the student now has income. If a student has someone they can call, like a parent, for example, or anyone to fix their financial emergency, they're not going to financial aid to tell them, hey, I just got $800 to get new tires. Can you go ahead and add that to my award package? It's a major equity issue if we are go going that route. The foundation is perfectly set up they're the experts in this kind of situation. They give scholarships, they understand our students, they fundraise, they, that's a perfect avenue for this type of aid. And so I think it's really important for us to point out why we do it that way um, and to talk about why that's an equity issue at a school like Highline. And that uh, <clears throat> needing cash assistance is not a reflection of somebody's 
individual morals or values <laughs> that it's just something that people need. Um, and the last thing I want to say, and this is, you know, you hear me getting it, but um, being a broke college student is not a rite of passage. Just because maybe you did that, maybe your family did that, maybe, you know, that's not what we need to do today. Our college students, like you saw before, are going through way more um, than the general population. And so we need to really have a lot of empathy and really think about ways that we can adjust our services. And when we start new programs, be very, very thoughtful about the way we approach them. <clears throat> and so um, the last part here is just more of the zooming out King County wide. Um, so we have the benefits of King County. That's their, their model, their strategy there in the yellow. Um, this is from last year's report of all the schools that participate in this Benefits Hub program, where students meet with our AmeriCorps coaches, they get signed up for public benefits, healthcare, ORCA cards, discount utility programs, they get referred to um, financial coaching and, and um, legal services and uh, mental health services. And you can see there at Highline, um, we have a very, very robust program. Um, with about 2,000 students served in just that one academic year and um, tons of interventions and supports. And then our last slide here just shows our website, um, just some screenshots of our website so you can uh, feel comfortable going there anytime to connect with us. We currently have a free tax campaign happening, uh, which we do every year, not stopping because it's virtual, um, to help people um, with those earned income tax credits and those other important filing situations. So. Um, I think we're going to hold our questions to the end, if I'm correct, and we're just going to keep moving along. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll pass it along here. Thank you, Mariella. Uh, the first time that we connected, all of I sort of got sort of a, a quick version of this, and it's I think very eye-opening, especially for faculty who haven't had the opportunity to um, connect more deeply with the work that you're doing. So thank you so much. And that kind of leads into um, the, the Guided Pathways project that um, really sort of stemmed from, you know, wanting to reach out to Mariella and others who are in student services, as well as students directly kind of from, from a classroom standpoint to ask them uh, again, sort of what is their experience. And uh, one of the things that we uh, found that confirmed everything that Mariella sees and, and through her research is one, a, a number of our students who responded to them to this uh, survey that we did, uh, they are caring for others, whether it's their, their children or siblings or parents, you know, their time isn't necessarily always their own. And, and for those of us who are also caring, we, we get that, right? Um, the other portion that I think was um, very eye-opening is that a number of our students again, like so many of us are dealing with their own either physical or mental um, uh, concerns or problems or those of the folks that they care for. So there's a lot to, um, you know, take into account to keep in context for why college, you know, can be difficult. I think um, some of the most helpful portions of the survey were some of the more qualitative answers that we got from students. So when we asked students, you know, when you started college, what was the one thing that you were most concerned about? Um, you know, a, a very common response is either money or paying for college, right? That is that is one of the big things. But in addition to that, it's, it's caring for loved ones and trying to balance um, moving to the next level, completing their degree, all of these things. Uh, it, it's a lot. And so that's something to, to keep in mind when we're teaching, when we're working with students, um, how they respond to things, that's, that's important. So the survey, that sort of um, transitions us into uh, talking about the need for this basic needs resources page in Canvas. And I'm actually uh, right now going to, I can open my chat, uh, send the link to the page to share with all of you. Um, so this is a public page, uh, it's linked in the chat. It will also be housed in the Canvas course shell for each 
um, course starting in spring. So similar to the policies and procedures pages that are already preloaded in there um, and the COVID-19 pages that are preloaded, this basic needs page will also be preloaded. And um, I'm actually going to jump over to that here. So I at least can show those of you who maybe can't click on the link. Okay, so here's our page. And the first thing you'll probably notice after you know some orienting language at the top um, are the eight sort of main core icons. Um, and these are icons that after some research, um, looking at other colleges and universities that um, offer sort of a basic needs page, um, I also connected with uh, Mariella and Loyal and Laquita and some others to really get a, a sense of like what, what's missing here because it didn't feel quite complete, especially for our students who have a wide range of needs that maybe aren't just food or housing. Um, and so they really pointed out some areas that were missing. For example, um, childcare wasn't one that we typically would see on some of these other pages or domestic violence and safety. So um, the page I feel like is more holistic because um, you know I had the opportunity to connect with experts um, in this area. So beyond the eight primary icons, um, and, and uh, Mariella, correct me if I'm wrong, these were kind of the ones that we decided were sort of the first go-to for students. Um, you know, some students, uh, depending on their situation, may not necessarily qualify for everything that's on here. And so, you know, if students have exhausted what's on the primary link for those core ones, uh, there are additional resources um, below, for example, for food and housing, um, you know, healthcare. There's also some links back to obviously our COVID-19 resources, um, other ways to pay for college and job opportunities, uh, direct pulling, you know, of information from the benefits hub. And then there's some, also some community resources um, that, uh, again, meeting with the team, really shared with me the importance of having some of these uh, additional community resources like 211 or uh, findhelp.org. Uh, more questions that, that were pulled um, and then direct contacts uh, primarily to the support center, but as well as the counseling center. Um, again, for students who are experiencing uh, healthcare needs. And then just some basic terms if students aren't quite sure what um, you know, food insecurity or housing insecurity means and whether they're maybe eligible for some of the resources that we have here. So that's kind of like the quick overview of it. Um, I'm actually gonna jump over here, let's see, and put up a quick poll. I wanna let you guys kind of poke around for a bit, <laughs> just for a couple, uh, couple seconds, maybe, you know, 30 seconds, just to kind of click on some of the links, see where it takes you, um, you'll notice Again, uh, a number of the core links will take you to um, some of our support center um, resources. Others may take you to um, community-based resources. So just kind of, you know, or at least hover your, your mouse over to see sort of what the link takes you to. Um, and then I'm just gonna sort of post a quick little poll of uh, three questions to sort of see where you feel like you might navigate um, uh, uh, directing a student for some of these uh, particular items. So I'll give you maybe a couple seconds. And I'm also looking at the chat a little bit too. Oh, great. There's awesome conversation happening. Yeah, can someone check how many clicks it takes to get to my website from the, um, for our, I just go support center.highline.edu. Uh, it's just whatever, however many clicks it takes to get to a regular department website. But I think my computer just like takes me there. Um, I don't know. Somebody asked me that and I said, well. Mariela. Yes. Is um, housing under WISH? Hey, um, yeah, there, yep, WISH. And then we also have the funds available. So the United Way Benefits Hub coaches have access to eviction prevention dollars as well as moving costs. Um, well, I have international students who uh, who needs housing and protection from domestic violence. Yeah, wish is a is a um, federal 
so it, it does require citizenship because it connects okay. to the section eight voucher but our funds that we have to help people move or to help people um, pay their rent or mortgage is not connected to any residency all right thank you mm -hmm. yeah all right so i'm going to launch the quick poll and this is just to see kind of what's the natural navigating pattern that we might have for some of uh, these particular uh, situations. So for example, uh, one of your students comes to you and says they live in Seattle, having difficulty paying for housing, which link might you direct them to? Uh, there's a couple different options, right? There's the housing link, uh, there's the financial assistance link, uh, Seattle housing authority link, or might you share with them all of these? Uh, so just maybe do sort of a quick poll there and then uh, we'll see what the results are. Responses are coming in. Do maybe about 15 more seconds and then I'll close the poll, see what we got. Okay, let's see. Okay, these are our results, right? So for the first question, uh, majority of folks said they would share all of these links. I think that works. Um, we never know a student's situation, so it might be helpful just to share, you know, everything we have. Um, for question number two, a student reaches out via email to let you know they won't be able to attend the last Zoom class because they were involved in a domestic violence situation. I think definitely um, the domestic violence uh, safety icon, that link there um, is sort of the perfect one, but it may be helpful to also share all of them. You, you never know. Um, and of course you can share the entire basic needs page with students um, just to see, to let them sort of decide what, what the best resource is. And then same thing for a uh, third question, I would say, you know, it may be helpful to uh, again, share all of those links we never really know what a student's uh, situation may be. So in the case of a student um, needing to pay utilities, um, financial assistance icon would be a great one, uh, childcare, but you may wanna share all that you have. Um, Two-on-one, um, as Mariella might be able to share if you have questions, I think is a great um, resource for students for more of the community. Um, based resources that they can find access to in their area. Um, same thing with findhelp.org. So sometimes more is better. Uh, we never know what students might might qualify for um, in certain areas. So yay. All right, I'm going now, to- One thing I wanted to add, just a little quick tip about yeah. that is when students you know, have something serious going on and we know that they turn especially to faculty so often um, that it's very important to kind of um, be mindful of using uh, terminology like should, right? You know, like, oh, you're experiencing DV, you should go do this and you should go do that. Like Shauna said, it's more about uh, providing them a buffet of options, you know, so they can make their decision what's best for them. Um, and knowing that they can turn to you, they're not always necessarily looking for someone to solve, right? But just someone to listen and someone to maybe connect them to the resources that are in the community. Because, you know, at Highland, we're not the experts in everything, but we are connected to folks who do have those expertise that can help guide them through whatever's going on. So just being mindful of um, keeping those good uh, boundaries with um, the relationship there. Thank you, Mariella. So now I'm gonna 
move to the next stage, which is Bob. Great, thank you very much. And Shauna, can you advance uh, slides for me? Can we get to the right point? I'll let you know. So thanks Shauna and Mariella very much for inviting me in today to have a chance to work with you in talking about basic needs. Right now, more than ever, we wanna be intentional and proactive in learning about and meeting students' needs. Ask students how they're doing. Give them time to share authentic responses to the question. It's about weaving a net of support so tight that no student is allowed to fall through the cracks. Shauna spoke about basic needs, especially now, those are often combined with instructional needs. But students may not ask for help. We know some, from research that students of color in general, minoritized students in general, and men of color in particular, may have challenges in seeking out help because of societal stereotypes. So I've chosen for today just three basic instructional needs that students may have. Their need for clear assignments, their need for flexibility when something goes wrong, and their need for options when navigating the instructional content. Can we go to the next slide? The first basic academic need surrounds TILT, transparency and learning and teaching. This is a framework with significant benefits for students learning that's been shown to have an even greater benefit for first gen, low income, and students of color. It involves outlining the purpose, task, and criteria for assignments. Purpose. What's the long-term relevance to their lives? Looking out three or even five years into the future. Clearly explicate at the beginning of the assignment or activity or lab project what the purpose is. Let the students know what skills they'll be practicing and the knowledge that they'll be gaining. Task. Let the student know what's the first thing that they should do and the next thing they should do and the next, all the way on up to the point where they turn in their work. If the students don't have to spend half their working time trying to figure out how to do the assignment, they can then spend 100% of their time doing their best work and turning in a sample of their best work. Criteria. Provide some real world examples of good work and a checklist or a rubric. Let the students practice using your rubric to evaluate a sample that you've brought in. This ensures that students can begin their work equitably at the same starting point with the same shared understanding of what good work looks like. Next slide. For most students, life and school are frequently on a collision course, perhaps now more so than ever. The second need students have is for us to become masters of paradox. That is to say, maintaining a structured course while allowing for some flexibility. Life happens to all of us, students and teachers and staff. To become masters of paradox, first, we organize the course clearly. Try and be as clear as possible about expectations, clear in terms of grading procedures or clear in terms of expectations for discussion board participation or timeliness of their submissions and so forth. We should still maintain rigor in our courses. To do that, it's helpful to communicate out the course expectations regularly to students. Think about growth mindset. Remind students to embrace challenges and see effort as the path to mastery. It's important in all realms of life, not just in college. Then practice empathy. Remember those collision courses. Be firm, but have some flex when things go wrong. It's especially important during COVID. Consider dropping the lowest test or paper score or allowing students to catch up or to resubmit work or being flexible on late work policies. Next slide. How do we know what students need? The third academic need surrounds universal design for learning or UDL, and it doesn't need to be confined to just instruction. I've always liked the equity definition of giving every student what they need to succeed. But we have no crystal ball and we don't want to guess or assume. Christopher Emden at Teachers College, Columbia University, 
defines equity as hearing someone's voice about what they need and then providing it to them. Equity is creating the opportunity for the students in front of us to share with us their ideas about what it is that they need. UDL suggests covering content in more than one format, which we likely do. Why not ask students which format works best? Even better, allow a student to teach or co-teach a lesson. Let the students understand we know they're the experts in how to deliver the information to each other. UDL also suggests giving students alternate means to demonstrate their learning. So if a student says, here's what I have the capability to do for this assignment using just my cell phone, is it okay? How affirming it will be for the student if the answer is a resounding yes. Next slide. We've covered three basic instructional needs. Tilt, their need to have clear assignments. Practicing paradox, their need for flexibility when something goes wrong. And UDL, their need for options on how to interact with instructional content. How do we know when we're meeting these three needs? Tilt, purpose, task, criteria. We've made assignments, labs, or projects clear for students. They can see themselves reflected in the purpose statement. With a refined task statement, they now avoid unproductive time expenditure, and they clearly understand the criteria for success. UDL, we can invite students to share how they learn best. They can provide examples or share anecdotes from classes that they felt were particularly effective and culturally reaffirming for them. Based on their needs, we can give them options for how they're interacting with the course content. And last again, practicing paradox. It's one of Highline's four connections. We communicate our expectations regularly, but still let students know all is not lost if they've missed a quiz or turn in an assignment late. We can maintain our course rigor, but also retain the ability to empathize and show some grace. It's important to think about ways to meet students where they're at in the midst of their increased time commitments, their daily trauma, and inequitable access to technology. Now is not the time to be rigid and inflexible. We have a great opportunity to demonstrate authentic care for our students through being empathetic and compassionate and flexible. And I think next we have uh, your turn, everyone. I think we have some scenarios coming up and some time for some breakout rooms perhaps, so. Yes, Bob, you are right. And thank you so much for um, all the amazing teaching strategies that you just shared. Um, to sort of kind of put everything together, we thought it might be fun to uh, have you guys go into breakout rooms, which I'm about to press send on now, um, and check out the two scenarios that we um, just posted in the chat and really just discuss them. There's, they're, you know, quick little scenarios that I think in a lot of ways may um, resonate with a lot of us because um, we see these types of scenarios in the classroom and, and when we're working with students. So um, go ahead and take a look at that link. I'm also going to create and open your breakout rooms and uh, go ahead and, and drop in and start reading and discussing with your group, maybe five minutes. I love when we come back from breakout rooms because I see all the smiling faces, all the people that I miss. <laughs> There's everybody. We miss you too. All the people. Oh, thank you. I miss going to, yeah, anyways, meetings and saying hello and crashing your meetings and talking about our events and moving along. <laughs> yeah, so welcome back, everybody. It's great to see you. Thanks for the love. Um. And we, Sean and I were just saying, you know, as soon as she hit the close button, nobody came back. So we're like, oh, they're using that last 60 second timer to continue the conversation. And I thought that was great. I love that you guys were uh, obviously chatting about this. So let's just have anyone go ahead and uh, share what did your group decide to do to support these students, Susan and Antoine? Yeah, Tim, never enough time in breakouts. I know, once you get going, right? So who would like to start? Let's hear from a couple people. Well, one, one thing our group thought would be really important would be if the student had been 
successful um, going on. And then all of a sudden you notice this tremendous drop off, the sooner the instructor could intervene and check it, check in and see what's going on, uh, the better. If, if you let it go for two or three weeks, the student is literally so far behind that, mm -hmm. that you can't affect any change. Yeah, that's a great point. Being attuned to your students' patterns, right? If if someone's normally cruising around here, just, you know, a little bump says normal, and then suddenly, then it's like, hmm, maybe I should be the one to reach out. Maybe I shouldn't wait for them to come to me. And I'm just going to do a quick sidebar that um, Nicole Wilson, our director of our counseling center, is also kind of available for this part of the conversation, should um, her expertise be needed as we discuss. So thank you, Nicole, for being willing to be a part of this uh, debrief conversation. Um, let's go uh, with at least one more person. What did your group decide to do to support these students, Susan and Antoine? I can, if I may say something. Thank we you, did not report anything. Oh, this is Sam from the Bistec department. Um, I, we did not really discuss what we should do, but what, what we think we should do, provide the right technology for the students early on. And also, I'll have a lot of uh, foreign students. English is not their native language. They have, uh, they have problems understanding the language, especially when they receive information for the financial aid. I have five students who find uh, different from different uh, uh, backgrounds. They didn't know how to proceed with the financial aid. They got accepted financial aid. All they have to do is just click on yes to move forward. They couldn't understand what that yes is. They didn't understand what the process is because English is not their first language. So I think making that language a little bit easier and providing different languages even better. Great point, Sam. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more. Someone put in the chat that someone in their group had a great response <laughs> and maybe that person wants to talk or, okay. Sure. That, uh, we only talked about Susan. We didn't get to Antoine, um, but we talked about, May brought up bringing it, doing things in, in chunks so it's not all overwhelming. And I suggested taking a look at what actions need to be taken and then walking the student through a couple of them, like helping the student, helping Susan craft a letter to her other teachers, explaining the situation, letting her know that I'll give her an extension, um, then taking her over to the counseling so she can set up an, an appointment because that seems like what she needs. It looks like she has her housing set up already, um, may need health care, but then once you've done couple of action items with her, then take her to that website where she can see what else is out there for her. So that if there's something that she didn't bring up, but she might need, she's got that resource. Yes, thank you. And one thing I wanna say is, you know, you're never gonna go wrong by referring them to a benefits of appointment. You know, we can always take students, we can always chat with them. We have resources that maybe they haven't even realized that they need. And with this student who just moved, I'm thinking, where did she move to? Is that permanent? Does she have money for that? What's going on with her other lease? Was that, a, is that she have um, that on her, res, uh, her record now for a lease, like a bad, did she break her lease? If she was a DV person, we can get that off her record. So she doesn't, you know, so I'm thinking like all these different things, right? But I don't wanna, like I said, Tell her what she should do but i'm just thinking about all well, all the different resources are out there so at the end of the day i just want to say you know you can never go wrong by send, sending them over to benefits hub um because we we do do like a nice thorough kind of run through of what they might be eligible for um even if the student you know doesn't have a whole lot to, to share if they just say i'm having you know some trouble you can still send them our way and that's totally fine um nicole is there anything that you wanted to add to the conversation I love, I just wanted to shout out to what Jean had just put in the chat too, is just kind of taking that moment to listen and validate because we all go into fix it mode. I mean, I can speak for yeah. myself too, right? So I love that, like, take a breath, like, wow, that must be really hard. I hear you. Mm -hmm. um, sorry you're going through that. But just as Mariella said, you know, you can send a student to counseling and or the benefits hub. We work, we send people back and forth all the time, right, to kind of go, okay, you know, for Susan, there were like three things, right? So it was kind of housing, mental health, medical issues, giving them some options and then letting them figure out what is most important to them. But I'm so excited for this Canvas site because everything is there. So even if they can't process it right away, they have the resources. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I love yeah. this. Thank you. Um, the second reflection question we have for everyone is, 
When was the last time you had a conversation like this with a real student and what did you do? And so this is also something you can throw in the chat or we can discuss, but I'd love to hear from one to two people about this and it can be anyone. When was the last time? Maybe it was this morning, you know? Um, is that you, Carmen? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm um, actually kind of in the middle of a conversation right now. Um, and I, I spoke about this in the breakout group. The biggest thing for me to give to whomever would actually be more on the front end before I throw out any sort of resources of where they can go, who they can speak to is time, time to process, time to look into however these resources come together, however they are disseminated to the student or to whomever is give them that time and space to actually like decompress, to take that breath, to, to kind of work through what it is that they need if they know what they need and work with them to determine, okay, this is where you can go, this is who you can speak to. So instead of just throwing out, yeah. this is where you can go, this is where you can go, this is what you can do, just take take a beat and, like I said, just just process what's going on and, and what it is that we can actually do for you. Thank you, thank you, Carmen, for sharing that. Um, looks like in the chat we have people that have been having these discussions with students as little as a few minutes ago, um, today, last week, uh, this morning, and I also wanted to point out what a couple of you mentioned. Jean, I see Jean that mentioned it and Shauna that, you know, what can we do? What can your faculty do for this? You know, Jean's thinking, okay, let's make a strategy for your faculty. Shauna, as a faculty said, you know what, I'll happily provide an extension because the purpose is for you to learn this work, not for you to get it in by 1159, right? So um, I just really appreciate everybody saying, even Dr. Mosby earlier this week. So yeah, I think that knowing that you guys are having these conversations with students so regularly just really validates the importance for us to come together as a whole Highland community to have this Canvas um, informational section to continue to update it and to have to know where to send students on campus. Like I said, we're more than happy counseling center. There are places you can send students when you're not quite sure what to do. And so speaking of- Are you alive? Oh yes, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I was just going to add that I also was struck just by the, the comments in the chat that, the, that these real needs that students have, I mean, they're, they're, they're present and they're in the moment and they're, they're constant and ongoing. And it's just a reminder, I've heard that so many college age students have so few adult role models in life, if any, besides maybe the folks that they interact with on campus each day, uh, including their teachers and staff. And, and we might be the only ones that have actually reached out and, and offered that helping hand and, and offered to find out how things are going. And then more importantly, um, had a chance to, to truly listen to them, so. Yeah, and you know, just as a college, as far as some of these basic needs data, I, I don't know of another college that has a data set as large as ours that we implemented with that exit survey at the pantry. I mean, I think it's over 6,000 individual responses showing those trends and how important that is. Um, and I think, you know, we can make a lot of really informed decisions with how, you know, the direction that we see our campus moving in um, with guided pathways, with this COVID, you know, 2021 year. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to know that there's so many, so many uh, people on board, even what Tim said earlier. I remember when I was on campus, when I was on campus so long ago, when we were on campus, um, someone from IT shared to me that sometimes student called the IT help desk because it says help you know, and you might be, you know, having somebody who's, yeah, and so they'll call there. And I remember we used to give their front um, desk folks the list of our resources and our calendar of when people were on campus so that they could still say, you have the wrong number. They would say, oh, we're here for IT help, but are you looking for la la la? And then here's the information. And so I just thought that that was such a beautiful example of uh, bringing our resources together. I don't know if our benefits hub coaches are on the line. I hope that they are. I know they were in, in the meeting earlier, but I was hoping that they would just pop their cameras on and say hello. We have a couple minutes for questions and some closing remarks. I see Chiquita there. Do you want to say hello, Chiquita? Yeah, hello, everyone. So excited to work with you all and looking forward to some referrals. Um, I will put my email in the chat. Thank Thanks you. Thank you.
If there are no additional questions, uh, and of course, um, we wanted to make sure that you guys know you can contact us. So I'll be sending out an email just again as a thank you, um, but with more contact information for us, as well as some of the links that we shared. Um, one of the things that we're hoping to do for the next step is to, whoops, um, and I'll share it in the chat, is to start um, or sort of reboot a little bit, right, Mariella, um, a basic needs steering committee. So we're hoping to, you know, have people who are willing to be a part of this to make it holistic and, you know, campus wide um, so that again, we can provide that, that whole support for students. Um, so if you're interested, I'll be sending that link out. Um, and then of course, we just wanted to give a last reminder, shout out that, you know, this work, this project is a part of you know, Guide Pathways, um, you know, as one of the, the many things that's going on to support students. Um, we just want to thank leadership for giving us the opportunity to come together, you know, from all these different sort of areas of the college, um, knowing that we all want to support students the best that we can. So um, again, thank you, Dr. Mosby, everyone, uh, and exec staff, um, you know, all, all our different areas. I mean, it's been um, a really tough year, but hopefully this can be just a small piece in um, closing some of those gaps for some of our students. Um, I don't know if anyone else wanted to share anything before, before we say bye-bye. Mm. I also wanted to give this thank you as well um, to all the awesome folks who have helped support this um, and to you know, again, just connect with us, connect with me to get this off the ground. So thank you guys. We have a couple of links that I think Shauna can throw in the chat too. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's on our last slide. It is yes. um, a sign up if you want Benefits Hub to do a five minute little yeah. um, class mm -hmm. presentation. Um, we have a suggestion box. And we also um, will be launching a Benefits Hub Steering Committee campus-wide. So if anyone is interested in participating in that, we're very excited about it and really happy to have representation from different parts of campus um, as we think about how to unfold this work for the remainder of 2021. Awesome. Thank you, guys. <laughs> have a great Thank rest you. of the week. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mosby. <laughs> Thank you. Great job. Thanks. Oh, how Thanks. do I stop recording now? Okay, there it is. <laughs>